We are back and we are joined now by Adam Featherman, reporting fellow with Type Investigations, uh, whose piece in the magazine In These Times is entitled The New Cold War in the Arctic. Uh, Adam, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So um, I loved your piece. I read it a few weeks ago and I was excited to have you on the show. Um, you know, you mentioned this in your piece that the, the moment during Trump's presidency, one of the uh, routinely mocked moments appropriately so um was when he said he wanted to purchase greenland and you know it's trumpian in its crudeness and it's funny in it to a degree but the impetus between bet uh, behind why he said that is actually shared by american interests and i was fairly unaware of this until reading your work here um what are those interests and how long have they been in place uh, in in Greenland? Yeah, I'm actually glad that you brought that up because uh, it's mentioned frequently whenever Greenland sort of is in the news. Uh, and one of the interesting things I think about Trump's uh, offer to buy Greenland is, is the fact that it wasn't the first time that the United States has expressed an interest in um sort of laying claim to, to the island. So those interests uh, in part are uh, mineral resources, which Greenland has in, in vast abundance uh, <clears throat> and which has kind of fueled this uh, geopolitical scramble for rare earth metals and, and minerals, both in the Arctic and in Greenland in, in particular. But I think from the US perspective, it's not just about minerals, it's also about maintaining our uh, military dominance in Greenland and, in fact, in the Arctic uh, at large. And the reason why Greenland is so kind of crucial in this context is that we have an existing base there that goes back to the early 1950s uh, and has a completely mind-boggling history, both in terms of its impact to Native communities in Greenland and sort of just in terms of the Cold War uh, nuclear posture of the United States. So. You know, in short, Trump's uh, gesture was sort of seemingly out of nowhere, but in fact, there's a lot, uh, a lot to it. And in fact, we're seeing that ramp up now as the Arctic becomes kind of a, a, a new staging ground for buildup of military forces, both on the part of Russia and then NATO and, and the United States, of course. So, yeah, there really are three parts of the story that I do want to hit on, right? It's the military objectives of, you know, the superpowers here that uh, the, the your piece talk, refers to it as, you know, the new Cold War. And I think that's apt here. Then there's the, the, the mineral uh, resources that you touched on as well and the significance of that. And also the displacement of indigenous populations in Greenland that has been going on for decades um, as a result of the United States trying to build up its military presence there for the geo for the strategic geopolitical reasons that that we'll get into. But I guess um, let's start with the, the the military piece of it. Um, I didn't realize that the U.S. Air Force has one of its biggest bases in Greenland. Um, and that was created, uh, and in its creation, I should say, displaced uh, indigenous populations in Greenland. Let's start there in the 50s uh, when, when that base was built. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was one of 17 U.S. military installations in Greenland that essentially came out of the Second World War when, in fact, the United States extended the Monroe, the, the Monroe Doctrine to include Greenland. Um, and uh, this particular base, then known as Thule, name has recently been changed, uh, was sort of the, the centerpiece of, of the US military presence in Greenland. Uh, and in 1953, the United States wanted to expand uh, that particular facility, which required essentially removing uh, more than two dozen families from a small village nearby. And at that time, Greenland was still a colony uh, of, of Denmark. And so the Danish authorities sort of managed this um, forced relocation at the, uh, you know, you know, with the backing of the United States. Uh, 
And that legacy and that moment is still very much um, living history in the village of Connacht, which is where I went to report this story, uh, and which is about 50 miles from um, uh, from from the the base itself. So, I guess I would just say that, you know, we have one large base remaining in Greenland. So the the sort of strategic significance of the island is not what it was in the 1950s, but this particular base continues to be crucial for both for US military operations in um, Europe and, and Russia in terms of satellite monitoring, um, but also in terms of potentially increasing our presence um, on the ground in Greenland. And and probably has renewed significance given the uh, fact that uh, Finland, uh, a border country of um, Russia has joined NATO in the wake of Russia's invasion of and continued war in Ukraine, um, and that Russia has uh, been has built up um, for a few decades at this point, according to your reporting. I'm learning this uh, their military presence in the Arctic as well. So, like, what is the what what is the renewed um, or uh, the new landscape in? Uh, in the post uh, Ukraine invasion, um, say about the future of Greenland in this strategic way? Yeah, I mean, it's very much in flux. And I, I think it's a really dangerous moment. I mean, we're seeing just this past week the weaponization of migrants in Russia uh, along the Russia Finland border, uh, partly in response to you know NATO expansion, both in Finland and, and, and likely Sweden. Uh, and I would, you know, Diplomatic relations between Russia and the other Arctic nations have reached levels last seen during the Cold War. There's very little communication between these powers. Uh, and at the same time, there is an effort to ramp up military activity in the form of naval and, and air exercises, both on the part of NATO uh, and Russia. So the, the potential for some kind of an accident or um, miscommunication is increasing exponentially, while at the same time, lines of communication between these parties are, um, you know, essentially non-existent. Uh, so I think the we can't really overstate the extent to which the war in Ukraine has completely upended diplomatic um, relations in the Arctic. And what that means going forward, I think, is very much an open question. And um, I, you know, there, the the fears there, too, are, are that the, like, in this Cold War conflict between two nuclear powers, the path for some sort of nuclear bomb to go from Russia to the U.S. or the other way around, the shortest route is over the Arctic. That, that's right. I mean, that's the strategic significance that, that Greenland um, has always occupied. Um, but in terms of the nuclear threat, I mean, it's not so much the, um, the geography, but I, I think it's really the fact that you know, the only remaining nuclear treaty between the United States and Russia is essentially um, dead. Russia effectively withdrew uh, and the United States has responded in kind and it's set to expire in 2026, I believe anyways. And there's really nothing in place to uh, uh, replace it. And at the same time, I mean, one of Russia's most important military um, facilities is on the Kola Peninsula, which borders Finland. It's its primary naval submarine uh, base and also uh, staging ground for, for nuclear uh, weapons. So you can imagine from a Russian perspective, the fact that NATO is now literally on that border is going to create some anxiety. And at the same time, Russia is relying increasingly on its uh, nuclear forces to um, maintain power and uh, dominance in the Arctic. Um, and, and so I guess that's a good opportunity to turn to uh, the resource battle there as well um, and how China is getting involved here. Uh, and the the oligarchs of the world, the Bezoses, the Michael Bloombergs, the Bill Gateses have been uh, expressing immense interest in resource extraction in Greenland. Um, what are those resources in particular, and, and what are their significance, uh, the rare min minerals 
to products like batteries and electric vehicles as we move forward and kind of into a new era of extraction and the the new uh the new kind of uh a landscape that that creates yeah i mean i think the rare earth metals so-called rare earth metals which china currently dominates the market for have emerged as kind of the 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 linchpin for the the green transition you know the the key elements that that we need to build uh wind turbines and 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 batteries and evs and all the rest uh they're actually not rare but they're they don't occur in large quantities in any particular place um but greenland has what are believed to be two of the largest rare earth deposits on the southern tip of the island so that has attracted a lot of attention uh and and it just in general greenland with enormous mineral potential and uh very few very few population centers has been seen as an attractive place to potentially produce minerals. Uh, and in addition to that, its proximity to North America and to Europe has, has you know, made it uh, even more attractive, I guess, to economic interests in those places. So we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, partnerships and efforts to kind of help Greenland develop its mineral resources. Uh, and I think it's also important to point out that despite all of the hype and attention on Greenland and its mineral deposits, there's actually very little active mining taking place there right now. So all of this stuff is sort of, you know, in the works and it remains to be seen whether the investment will be there and whether it's possible to essentially develop the kind of supply chains that you need to produce these minerals in uh, the Arctic, which has little infrastructure and is, is obviously a difficult place to, to operate in. And, and how is the government of Greenland and their representatives responding to this? Um, uh, like, I, I guess, and, and the renewed interest in, in investment and in, in extraction uh, in Greenland? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's often one that gets lost in this sort of geopolitical intrigue surrounding Greenland. But generally speaking, Greenland is quite open to mineral uh, development in the country, in part because they do not have full independence from Denmark and they see mining and the revenue that would be generated from mining as a way to uh, achieve full autonomy and, and fund um, their government, essentially. They still receive a, a block grant from Denmark that accounts for, I think, more than half of their annual operating budget. So uh, government has been quite receptive and, in fact, is working with the U.S. State Department to sort of overhaul its um, uh, mining regulations and, and uh, uh, agencies. Uh, but that said, there is still uh, some opposition and concern in Greenland about the impacts of mining. And in particular, there is a rare earth mine that is now tied up in litigation because there are high levels of uranium along with these rare earth metals. So in that particular community, folks have organized to oppose the project. And it, in fact, sort of led to the rise of the current left-leaning party, which is in power in Greenland. So the the dynamics are, are, are interesting and um, will certainly shape the way the development, you know, evolved going forward. Well, uh, really fascinating stuff, something to monitor. Uh, Adam Featherman, uh, the piece is called The New Cold War in the Arctic. You can read it in, the, in These Times magazine, and we will put a link to it uh, wherever you're listening to or watching this. Uh, thanks so much, Adam. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Great to be here.